Welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I'm here with my co-host, the creator and founder of Genetic Insights and Feel Younger, Ellen Robinson. And today we are discussing the Rejuvenation Blueprint and going further into it, into, you know, how you can practically apply it. And also, you know, in the sense of how it compares to other systems and really how you can use it to get to your health goals. So Ellen, tell me, why do you feel and believe that the Rejuvenation Blueprint is the best system possible to work out how people can really resolve their health issues and really meet their health goals? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, because I developed it really because I tried so many other systems and all of them, you know, all the ones that I, I guess, invested some time in, they all had some validity and were all helpful to some degree, but none of them gave a complete picture of what I needed. I've talked a lot in this episode, sorry, in this podcast, as well as on a lot of other people's when they're interviewing me about the key insights that genetics gave me, and that's true. But sometimes I also do mention that it is only one out of seven steps, and all of them are potentially extremely important and extremely relevant. So the rejuvenation blueprint, um, in my experience, yeah, it was the only thing that was able to help me. And I have actually um, had the privilege of working with quite a few people now since developing it. And I've yet to come across uh, an occasion where it doesn't help you find the answers and just to explain what it is it is a kind of maybe a series of seven questions that you ask where if pursuing whatever path you've tried to pursue in the past where maybe you thought it was down to diet maybe you tried mainstream medicine maybe you tried energy healing maybe you tried whatever like no matter what you've tried all of those things can be good and highly effective and all you need but sometimes they're not and so I wanted to create a system that really included everything that you might need like a mnemonic so that you won't forget a crucial element that you might have been not considering why this is not already done why I've had to invent this actually boggles my mind I guess that's what they say with a good invention that like it seems extremely obvious and maybe it does already exist and I wasn't the first person to come up with it that's distinctly possible if so I'm happy to be corrected um, but it seems to me that if you ask yourself these seven questions then you will always be able to get to the root or roots because often there's several causes of whatever issue it is that you want to work on and improve or whatever goal you want to reach so I think we explained this over the course of three or four hours on recent episodes, the Rejuvenation Blueprint 1 and 2. So I'm just going to do a very quick summary. So the seven questions I'll ask myself is, number one, is there a genetic component to this? Is there a genetic tendency for me to be more likely to suffer with this? And in fact, you know, if it is a genetic component, is it something that I can do something about? So usually it is, but sometimes it isn't. Um, like, for instance, some allergies and intolerances while you can certainly reduce the level of symptoms you get if there is a genetic component to you having that maybe you'll never be 100 percent okay with that because your body just reacts to that some people just have hay fever or some people just have you know gluten intolerance or whatever now skeptics will point out well all of that stuff is way more common now than it used to be and i think that's true and i think that's because there are many other things going on other than genetics and as i say even if you have a genetic factor um, symptoms can still be way worse, like it can express way more if there's other uh, negative factors going on that are making things worse. But nonetheless, understanding of the genetic factor will help you to know um, if it's kind of inborn to some degree, and also it helps you know what you can do about it. In our genetic insights, we give guidance that based on your genetics, here are some recommendations. So the first question, is there a genetic factor involved? Second question, is there a deficiency of some kind? When it comes to deficiency, I mainly focus on what I call building blocks, meaning, you know, we have a physical body. It's made out of physical stuff. What is that? Nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen, carbon, stuff like that. And also little things like a little bit of calcium, a little bit of vitamin B12, all that kind of stuff, right? I would actually expand that to say I would include frequencies of light in that. We haven't really talked about that. but No, we haven't. That's a really good point. Infrared light, red light, blue light even, green light, ultraviolet light. All of these are things that it's demonstrably true that if we have a deficiency of them, it can potentially cause health challenges. So I would include those as well. I would include the macronutrients, the micronutrients, oxygen, water. Um, and then possibly, although I 
really need hard science to include anything in this framework. But if it's proven, maybe types of energy as well, you know, that w would potentially be included as well. Um, certainly, you know, ATP is the type of energy freely uh, acknowledged in uh, Western science. But if anything else is ever proven and it's something that we need and a lack of causes illness, then it will be in this category too. Right. Um, so like, you know, because we all do have our own field around us that's a, a bit of a, an electromagnetic field. So it could be something that's a frequency or something like that. That's what you're referring to? If there is a lack of it, then it would come under this category. Yeah. Is there a deficiency? Yeah, exactly. Um, and then the next question is, is there an excess of something? So whereas deficiency, we're normally talking about something nutritious or something nourishing that we need, that we're lacking. It, when it comes to excesses, um, we're talking about something that there is too much of and therefore it is at best overloading the body, at worst outright poisoning, corroding, liquefying cells, you know, whatever it might be. And, and that so could even be a supplement as well, not just something. It's something that's a toxic overload to the body. Yeah, so the reason why I phrase it as is there an excess of something rather than saying is there like too many toxins is because as you say, the uh, difference between whether something is a nutrient or a toxin in some cases is a matter of doses. Not, not in all cases. Like with something like mercury, there is no amount that is nutritious. There is no amount that is good. But with something like iron or copper, there is an amount that is good and there is an amount that is bad right so one person if they have an iron issue their issue is an iron deficiency another they have anemia for instance another person if they have an iron issue their issue is an iron excess maybe they have uh, hemochromatosis or you know whatever it might be something to do with excess iron so um that's the third category to ask is there an excess of something number four um, is there an imbalance of uh, chemical cell signaling instructions? And in this category, I usually look at primarily hormones, uh, also neurotransmitters and peptides. So the reason I give these their own category is, first of all, because it's not necessarily a deficiency or an excess, it's more of a balance issue and how they relate to each other. Second of all, because it is so important, that's why I put it in its own category. And Third of all, probably more than anything, it's so impactful. Like if you find that a person just has an excess of something, like estrogen or cortisol, or they have a lack of something, like T3 thyroid hormone or progesterone or testosterone, then correcting that by directly supporting them with a uh, bioidentical version of what they need can be really transformative. And it can also be a supportive step while maybe some of the other stuff is being worked on, like resolving the excesses and resolving the deficiencies. So uh, that's number four. Is there an imbalance of those? Number five, um, is there other lifestyle or environmental um, cell signaling instructions which are creating an imbalance? So that's the kind of stuff that usually is classified in the category of lifestyle factors. So this would be, are you getting enough sleep? Are you getting, uh, is there too much stress and not enough rest and relaxation? Um, what's the level of exercise? Is it too little? Is it too much? Um, that kind of stuff. So not to do with the amount of toxins in the environment. Again, that would be back to the excesses thing. Not about are you getting the right nutrients in your food? That would be back to the, the, the deficiencies thing. But specifically all the more process-oriented stuff around how you live your life. Do you have healthy relationships? Um, all of, uh, you know, do you, do you sleep at the right time? Do you sleep enough? Or, uh, all of that kind of stuff. So that's a good question to ask. Question number six, is there some kind of pathogenic uh, infection going on which is undermining your health or stopping you reaching your goal? Uh, we usually make the distinction between acute and chronic infections. Acute infections, normally if you have it, you know about it, and it's an emergency uh, to, to one degree or another. You certainly know about it, and usually that's something that you need to bring to a doctor. Whereas a chronic infection is often something that uh, is not bad enough that it cl is classified as an emergency, but it's something you can struggle with for years or decades, and it's just subtly undermining your health and causing all kinds of other systemic issues. A well-known one is that, for instance, gum disease, gum infection can long-term significantly increase the chance of having cardiovascular disease, which is obviously the number one or number two killer uh, throughout most of the world. So, you know, big deal. These little ignored chronic infections can end up being a big deal and get in the way of your overall health and well-being. And then lastly, 
it may not seem to be in the same category as all these and it may not seem to be as scientific, but it actually very much is. And we've talked about this in more detail. I won't talk about it in too much detail, but emotions and mindset is what I'd call it. So there is the placebo effect where if you truly believe you will be well, then usually you are. And there's the nocebo effect, which is if you truly believe that you will not be well, you also won't be. Um, so it actually works both ways. Either and, way, you're right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's not easy to placebo yourself, admittedly. Uh, usually the placebo effect is like where we genuinely believe that someone else is providing us with something that will heal us or in fact make us worse. Uh, but it is potentially possible to placebo yourself. And people like Dr. Joe Dispenza have done you know, good work on proving that it although not easy, it is possible to uh, heal yourself with the power of your own belief if you are committed enough to doing so. So, and the reason I include this is because sometimes all the other practical physical stuff that we've covered in the first six steps, for some reason, it still doesn't seem to work or it still doesn't seem to be enough. And then when I look at that, I see that often there is a, maybe a belief I will never be well or you know, just like uh, my, both my parents were always sick and so therefore I will always be sick or maybe I don't deserve to be well or all of these kind of things that can be like deep-seated trauma, deep-seated disempowering, basically sickness-causing beliefs that no matter how much practical stuff you give someone or do for someone, it, it blocks them from being well. And so that's why I think it's a really important factor to focus on. And also for some people... They may be in a situation where none of the stuff in the first six categories has been proven to help. There are certain things that are considered incurable, not just by mainstream medicine, but even by all the alternative practitioners. And so a person in that position, they still have step seven to go to. If they're committed enough and determined enough, they can still use the power of their will, um, as I say, with enough commitment and enough uh, de uh, dedicated focus that they can potentially heal themselves even the things that are supposed to be completely uncurable some people of course that's all they teach and I do understand it but it's not my step number one because as I'm kind of emphasizing it takes a lot of discipline and commitment and effort that most people just are not willing to go to usually when people do it is because they feel extremely desperate and extremely motivated um and even in those conditions there are a lot of people honestly who i've met who are in really bad situations really bad positions and they still don't have the discipline to you know focus enough on being well like feeling uh you know if you're a constant pain for instance then trying to convince yourself that you're happy and free of pain and all the rest is very very difficult and so i'm not you know belittling anyone if that if they struggle with that and again that's why i wouldn't start with that i would start with all the practical stuff first which is in many ways easier yeah i like it how you've laid it out and when because when we've discussed it about okay certain places to start and so i know we'll get into that of how to practically use it and where the you know best beginning point is um do you want to actually make you know let me ask you that now where is if somebody's looking at it and going okay hey i do want to talk about where where would they start yeah so that's a great question. It does depend on what it is to some degree. And so I know most of this episode will plan to just go through common issues that people have and explain how they would apply uh, the rejuvenation blueprint. We're not going to give all the answers because often it takes a whole episode to give all the answers for one category, whether it's digestive health or cardiovascular health or whatever. So, But we're going to give an example of how if you have an issue, here is how you would go through the checklist and find the answers for yourself. Or if you're already working with a practitioner or several practitioners, as many people are, this is questions you can ask them, right? Do you think it could be any genetic factors? Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Do you think it could be any kind of deficiencies of anything? Oh, do you see what I mean? Like you can prompt them and also help them uh, to potentially work it out if they are, you know, open-minded people, which hopefully they are if you're entrusting your, your health and well-being with them. Um, so, yeah, to go back to your question, it... Depends. However, I do have a few kind of general uh, rules of thumb. I generally like to start with the genetics first, in, if possible, because it is so cheap and easy for most people. When I say cheap, it's not free, which you could argue lifestyle changes are, category number five, but it's cheap to get a lot of information compared to any other kind of test. So compared to the blood test, all tests, urine tests, saliva tests of any other kind, I can 
just as a you know as someone who's going through stuff i can get so much more information out of you per dollar by looking at your genetics than any other test that exists out there so that's the perspective that i'm looking at it from and so that's why i i like to start there if possible if the person's open to it um deficiency i put next because it is uh you know what if i'd have recorded this a year ago i might have said the only reason i do it is because it's the what's the word like the easiest the most the harmless. easiest fix yeah yeah to try and help someone um but honestly the more i am working with people these days with this system the more i'm seeing i'm, I'm actually surprised at how often the resolution is only that or if not resolution like significant massive improvements i'm seeing this over and over again it's not even you know though i do have a nutritional kind of focus which is usually what i'm focused on when it comes to deficiencies you know i'm kind of more into other things as well i'm quite into you know steps three four five seven i guess all of those i'm quite passionate about so it's not the first thing i'll go into um, but I'm amazed at how often I'm like, oh, you need more glycine, you need more iron, you need more vitamin B12, you need more vitamin K2, whatever it might be. And they just do that and then they feel so much better and they don't like they don't even follow most of my advice. All they do is just take a supplement again because it's so easy or they start eating a food particularly high in something again just because it's so easy. And they're like, oh, I feel so much better. And, and not just feel so much better, but, you know, I've been to the doctor and they've told me that, I don't have this anymore, I've had that, or, you know, I lost 50 pounds of weight just by taking this nutrient. Again, like, I wouldn't claim it and I'm because people are going to try it and, and it won't work for them, and then they're going to say that you told me, no, 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 I'm not saying it worked for you. I'm saying it's possible that just taking a nutrient will help you to achieve all these wide range of goals. And um, that's also after you've potentially looked at certain tests and other things and noticed that there is a, a need for more supplementation and like, oh, okay, there's the fix. Yeah, definitely with the genetics. Um, sometimes ideally, you know, like confirmed with blood tests as well. And that's definitely my preference, but not everyone will do it. Again, the genetics are just so much cheaper um, uh, to evaluate that. If the genetics tell me that someone needs more of some things like iron, I'm reluctant to tell them to take it because you can easily overdo it with iron. But some people just do it anyway because everyone has the right to choose what they want. Um, but certainly if it's something like K2 or B12 or magnesium or something where it's very hard to overdo it, B vitamins, then I usually say just try it and see how you feel. And it's amazing how often they do feel better. So as I said, usually I would recommend, I would have said a year ago, I recommend it often as a starting place just because it's so easy. But now I'm actually going to add because it's often so effective, actually surprisingly so. So it's a good place to start. I usually don't recommend starting with uh, step three, the excess is, or step six. The other thing that I often start with with people is step four, chemical cell signaling agencies, specifically hormones. Because they just, again... With the nutrients, I'm surprised when it makes such a big difference, but with the hormones, I'm not, <laughs> you know? And they do make a massive difference very frequently. Um, the the more you already feel okay, like when you first started working with me, Chrissy, you're already feeling pretty good. So any changes that you experienced have been fairly incremental. But, you know, I see people who are like really struggling in one dimension or another, and it is you know, miraculous within a few days uh, or a few weeks, depending on what it is, how people completely transform. Um, and so that's often I'm tempted to start with that. Now, I don't give anyone any hormones. I'm not a doctor. What I say is, what I mean is, I might look at what they're telling me or ideally I'm going to look at what their genetics are telling me and what the blood tests are telling me, maybe other data like temperature. And then I'm going to say, based on what you told me, I think you should see this kind of doctor or this kind of practitioner because, you know, it, it, it seems that there's a reasonably high chance of this. And so that's how I normally do it. Um, lifestyle factors. The people who I recommend to start with lifestyle factors are people with no money and time, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is plenty of people, right? So why not just everyone, Elwin? Because, again, going to bed early, exercising regularly, like eating in a, you know, uh, balanced, uh, frequent, but not excessive way, all these kind of things, again, takes willpower, it takes discipline to a certain degree. And if you're really struggling, 
It, um, meditation is another example. All of these things are fantastic. But if you're really struggling, all of them could be really difficult. So you take someone with extreme anxiety, and yes, having them have more sleep or having them regularly do meditation or having them do yoga or even honestly having them do intense exercise, all those things are extremely beneficial for that situation. But all of them are also extremely difficult often for a person in that situation. So that's why I'd rather try and calm them down first, maybe by giving them a nutrient like, I don't know, glycine or magnesium or something, maybe by supporting them and getting them cells the right hormone support maybe reducing cortisol or increasing progesterone or whatever and then we can go back to sleeping better meditating more resting more uh, exercising more whatever it might be once they found a bit more equilibrium and once they're not in a in a you know extreme state of uh, disharmony and imbalance within themselves so that's why i don't usually start with that step unless as I said, the person doesn't have any money to do any of the others, and then it's still a, a great place to start as long as they have the discipline to do it. And you br you just brought up an amazing point there too, because you're also trying to set these individuals up for success. And if they're not in a space where that they can be successful with that, then that just has a knock-on effect, which is not in the direction that we want to go. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a great point, Chrissy. I kind of take that for granted. But yeah, my goal is the result, not the righteousness of what I'm saying. So... You know, it's obvious that um, to everyone, including, you know, people who don't do it, that if they were to move, at least moderately move more regularly, and if they were to at least moderately, um, you know, be more aware of what they're eating and stuff like that, like everyone agrees if they were to rest and or meditate more often, everyone agrees that that's a good idea pretty much, at least in our, you know, kind of alternative health world. And yet so many of us don't do it. Because of various reasons, right? Maybe we, uh, you know, and usually it's kind of emotional, mental kind of reasons. But what is emotional, mental? It's really down to, again, hormones and neurotransmitters, a lot of it, as well as neurological habits and maybe um, things set in birth by genetics. So, but the, the, still, the hormones and neurotransmitters, if you optimize them, can still shift that significantly. So, yeah, that's why I don't necessarily start with. This is all the things you should do. I'm, I'm trying to work out what is like the most impactful thing that is realistic for this person to actually do that's going to give them the biggest increase um, in feeling good, that's going to move them towards their goal the most, that then will create momentum and leverage for them to start doing the other stuff that maybe is more challenging to ask them to implement which goes back to the point i was saying earlier it's why i don't start with excesses or pathogens because both of those are fairly troublesome um <laughs> to put it mildly I, and i and i say this because a lot of systems they actually do teach this right they uh you know in a famous example I'll talk about these more in a minute but like functional medicine for instance the first step of their five-step program is remove. It's looking at um, chronic infections, usually in the gut specifically. Uh, and then there's loads of systems out there. I won't mention anyone by names, but they're usually mentioned after gurus, uh, named after gurus who focus straight away on detoxification, which again, usually the process of getting excesses out also reduces the also, sorry, exacerbates deficiencies. Usually it involves fasting or excre increasing excretion. Slows down metabolism. Sweat, yeah. Sweating, slowing down metabolism, all the rest of it, which all reduces the uh, the input, the, the, the uh, nutrients coming in. So, yeah. That those are the two the two that I don't start with, even if I think it's the root problem. Even if I sense, hmm, this person's problem really is some kind of toxin or some kind of chronic infection. What I usually want to do is two goals: make them stronger and make them happier. That's the first thing. Once they're stronger and happier, because trying to address toxins and or chronic infections will at least temporarily in the majority of cases make you less strong and less happy. <laughs> so <laughs> if you're already you. not very strong and not very happy. And in my earnest attempt to help you, I'm making you feel even less strong and happy. Even if I am also helping you, it's not good. <laughs> um, so I want to, 
I want it to make you so much stronger and happier before you start that stuff that even when you're doing that stuff, you may be you may become less strong and happy again, but you're still not less strong and happy than you were before you started with me. You're a bit <laughs> more fortified. Sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, so that was really, really informative and insightful. So now uh, what we had discussed, what we're going to do is look at a few other systems and other things that are out there just to kind of give everybody a little bit of a... Um, can I say a comparison of really looking at what this is against what the rejuvenation blueprint is. And so um, just want to go ahead and start off like the first one on the list here, uh, Dr. Gundry, the plant paradox diet. Oh yeah. And we are going to mention a few people by name here. So all these people, if they're on the list list, that's because I greatly admire them, first of all, and I've learned from them. Um, this is not knocking anyone. This is only saying if you've already tried it and you're not 100% yet, it's not because this person is wrong. It's be just because it may be incomplete. And so that's what we want to point out. And also because these systems may have very well worked for someone. And then it's Loads also, yeah, exactly. So then it's also looking at it. Oh, well, this was step whatever on our rejuvenation blueprint. So that's what that individual needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So with Dr. Gundry and forgive me if you're watching or listening to this and you feel like I'm oversimplifying. If I'm just simplifying, I would ask you to forgive me for that. But if you think I'm outright missing something, then I apologize in advance and please leave it in the comments and YouTube and um, I will acknowledge <laughs> that I've got it wrong. But this is, you know, I haven't spent ages researching this list. This is just going from memory. But as far as I'm aware, the essence of Dr. Gundry's work is um, lectins, and our immune system's response to them. And so just to clarify this, when I talk about deficiencies and then excesses, we talked about the difference between, say, iron, which could be good or bad depending on how much you have, and mercury, which is just bad. Well, there's actually another category that's very important to understand, which is there are all kinds of substances like lectins, like oxalates, like salicylates, um, like um, phytoestrogens, maybe that your um, that may be much worse for one person than another, not because they're innately toxic or not. Although you could argue, yeah, some of those things I just listed are innately toxic, and Dr. Gundry does argue that lectins are innately toxic. Um, but because of the reaction that your immune system creates to them, so. There's nothing innately toxic about um, plant pollen, for instance, certainly not breathing it in. You could argue maybe that it is if you ingest it um, a little bit. But obviously, to some people, it causes an immune system reaction. And so it's worse than breathing in like uh, smoke. You know, it's like really bad um, for them in terms of how it makes them feel. And so I'd say Dr. Gundry's system is fundamentally focused on the excesses, specifically, as I say, in his case, lectins. Um, and... So for those where that is the problem, they're going to get a lot of benefit from that. Um, for those to whom excesses of that particular thing that acts like a toxin is not the issue, it won't be as effective. Wonderful. Okay, so that's really looking at it. So D Dr. Guntry's system is more in that number three category of the rejuvenation blueprint. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. The I next... don't think he talks about hormones. I don't no. think he talks about, you know, it's like mindset and chronic infections. I don't believe he talks about any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. And another one on the list, um, eat right for your blood type. Yeah. So this one, I would say, as with a lot of diets, is fundamentally focused on uh, two and three, which is uh, deficiencies and excesses, but specifically focused on excesses, right? It's like, but it is both because the idea of any kind of, you know, depending on X, you need this kind of diet. The concept is some people need more of some stuff. Some people need less of other stuff. So because you are this type, you need more of this and less of this, whatever it might be. Right. I, I'm trying to think, is it the eat right for your blood type diet where they like focus on purines, for instance, purines, like some people need more. And oh, no, sorry, that's the metabolic typing diet. I think that's later on our list. But, you know, there's a kind of basis behind it often that there are certain nutrients that are good and bad. Like, um, and I, it's been years since I read this, but like um, type uh, type uh, A is not good with dairy and type O is good with meat and stuff like that, I remember. So it's so the idea that there are certain types that this, you're more likely to have a deficiency of something and there are certain types that you're more likely to have an excess of something. That's really the crux of the system. And again, 
If that is your issue and if that is correct for you, then great. What it isn't, even though it might sound like it, that one to me is it's not step one. It's not the genetic issue because it's it's based on the blood type, which are related to the genetics, but it's not actually based on the genetics. It's based on blood type specifically. I have not had any luck following that diet myself. I have not... Uh, met many people but i haven't met a couple of people who swear that it was right for them so again anything that works for people great but yeah it's it's focusing on steps two and three yeah interesting that you could put those two, two together but that absolutely makes sense uh, the next one is a functional medicine so functional medicine is pretty broad as i said it's more the um order of doing things that i would tend to disagree with uh with them more as a matter of style as opposed to the you know i fundamentally think it's a bad idea i guess it makes sense to the medical doctors that with medical doctor it's like if you go to medical doctor and they make you feel worse you're more like willing to put up with it <laughs> than someone else um so you know focusing on the remove step first and actually on a practical level the functional medicine doctors i met like dr miriam who is uh, on the podcast sometimes she actually doesn't necessarily start with that step anyway um she does i think often start more with is it the restore step or something like that and and helping people optimize hormones and stuff so yeah uh, functional medicine is pretty broad sometimes they focus on genetics although often they don't i know dr miriam does and is looking to incorporate genetic insights um they do focus on deficiencies they do focus on excesses um Sometimes they focus on the chemical cell signal instructions, uh, but not necessarily. Like, for instance, in this country, the only reason, the UK, the only reason Dr. Miriam is able to focus on that is because she is also a medical doctor. But otherwise, if she were a functional medicine doctor and not a traditional medicine doctor, she would not be able to prescribe hormones. Um, in the US, I believe it's a little bit different. In the Europe, I think it's generally like the UK, though. So this partly this is the practitioner is limited by the laws of their particular country as to what they can focus on. Um, functional medicine, kind of, I, in my experience, um, pays some degree of homage to step five, um, but it generally it's not the major focus uh it's not one of the five steps uh, as far as i understand and as i said they put a big step on a uh, big focus on step six i actually i have met a practitioner who also focused on step seven the emotions and, and mindset um I, I think that was with mold illness they were like recommended a um a mindset shifting program which name i can't remember uh to help kind of stop the uh, autonomic nervous system to overreacting to different toxins that was like a brain rewiring system so yeah functional medicine i would say is pretty broad and that's why i'm pretty happy to recommend it and you know have functional medicine practitioners on here pretty regularly yeah which is nice too i think and as well if you're working with the right type of person then you know bringing this list to them they're going to be more open more willing to really investigate in these areas yeah yeah exactly if there was any practitioner who you could ask all the seven of these questions to and have them understand your questions and be likely to come up with an intelligent answer then that might be near the top of the list i hope you're enjoying this episode i just need to take a moment to quickly tell you about a way that you can support the podcast by getting high quality affordable supplements that elwin and i personally use and that's feel younger what i love about feel younger is they have great quality products with minimal fillers but the prices are very affordable you can call their customer support team 20 hours a day seven days a week and in my experience they're really helpful and friendly and what i love most of all is the amazing descriptions elwin's written for each product category about that topic. There's so much information and education on it. I've actually learned more from reading their product descriptions than I have from most articles. So to support the podcast, please use Feel Younger for all your supplement needs. And to let them know we sent you, you can use promo code rejuvenateme for a 20% discount off your first order at feelyounger.net. That's 20% off your first order with promo code rejuvenateme at feelyounger.net. Right, the next is a nutritionist. Yeah, so nutritionist, as the name implies, they're really going to be focused more on uh, deficiencies. That's like the number one thing. Um, they're also commonly, though, in practice, in my experience, also focused on excesses. They're often focused on toxins, uh, whether it's in food or in other contexts. Um, they're occasionally, and these days, more commonly aware of genetics, but I'd say that's still the minority of nutritionists. And you know, generally, if you read a book by a nutritionist, it's going to be about getting, making sure you get enough nutrients, not getting too many things that are toxic, and then maybe 
uh, what's the word, cursory mention of, you know, emotions and mindset, cursory mention of lifestyle stuff, but the vast majority of focus is really on deficiencies and excesses. And next on the list, one of my faves, Dr. Joe Dispenza. Yeah, big fan of his. Obviously, we talk about him a lot, uh, but his system is pretty much purely step seven. You know, it's emotion and mindset. Um, yeah. And prior to that, he was a chiropractor, correct? Yes, yes. Right. I believe he still is, although I don't know if he still has his license. Um, and so, you know, uh, yeah, in fact, we don't have that on the list, but we could just add that to the list. So what is chiropractic? Um, I would say that that is focusing on uh, step five. I would say the... Um, what's the word, the correct alignment of your spine, I would put that under like an, you know, an environmental um, factor. So, uh, you know, as I said, I divide it between kind of internal chel uh, chemical cell signaling instructions, which are more, you know, within the bloodstream and then the central nervous system, which I would, include, you know, hormones, neurotransmitters, stuff like that. Uh, this, your spinal column, even though it is obviously inside you, um, I, you know, maybe it's arbitrary, but I'd kind of, Consider, consider it more as an external thing and certainly the way they work on it is externally right they're not injecting you with something they no, are precisely you precisely and it's also something that's a choice for you to do i mean so are other things but it's a and you know an adjustment it's like just like exercising as well in a way because it's a, something that you're choosing to um support your body with or or not and i'm not you know uh putting only chiropractic in that category i would say yoga yeah say any kind of exercise um any kind of body work all of those things i would put under uh, step five um dr hulda clark yeah big fan of her um so you know i think one of her books is called the cure of all disease or the cause of i think the cure of all disease yeah, she's um, focused on detoxing right mostly well, i mean that's some of the stuff i've seen from her uh two things excesses and pathogens she does talk a bit about deficiencies as well. Um, so, you know, and she, a bit of talk about hormones, but her treatments are really focused on, number one, getting rid of um, uh, pathogenic organisms. And as you said, she believes that the root of why you have excess pathogenic organisms is because of toxicity. So those are really the two fundamental fo things she focuses on in her system. Focuses, again, a bit on deficiencies as well and a little bit of hormones and stuff um and lifestyle factors but yeah it's fundamentally like a step step three and a step six the very things that i recommend not to start with is exactly <laughs> what uh her system is focused on yeah and going back to the couple episodes that we have done on detoxification you go into detail of why that's important there's certain things to have in place before even beginning those steps yeah and i partly learned that i think from a student of dr holder clark i can't it might have been Andy Cutler, but I'm not sure who has the Mercury Protocol. Um, mercury Detoxification Protocol. Again, you could say he kind of focuses on the same two steps because, you know, it's a lot, it's related to Dr. Clark's system. But the one thing he added, which I thought was so helpful, is, and again, if it's not Andy Cutler, sorry for not crediting the right person. But he talks about before you do any detoxification or any parasite cleanses or whatever they recommend. Uh, liver flushing as well, stuff like that, uh, which again, I'd put on the excesses category. Um, you need to get your adrenals and your thyroid right. And I think that's extremely accurate, extremely helpful. And it was a big turning point for me realizing the importance of that. So I really should remember who I got it from. I'll try and <laughs> dig it up. But anyway, um, and so that's step four, right? And so uh, realizing the primacy of step four, and I agree with that order, as I've said earlier, you know, that you really need to get um, your thyroid and adrenals at least, and really ideally other things like testosterone and progesterone um, at a reasonably optimal level before you embark on something as difficult as, say, removing a lot of mercury from your system or removing a very stubborn infection. And that's the kind of stuff that Dr. Clark and her students who end up becoming teachers are usually focused on. Beautiful. Well, that segues really wonderfully into the next one, which is really liver, gallbladder cleanses, kidney cleanses, you know, Andreas Moritz, Dr. Schultz, and, uh, you know, other other individuals that may be focusing on those areas. Yeah, again, big fans of these, as, as everyone we've talked about. Um, so that is specifically focused uh, on excesses, right? You have an excess of toxins in your liver, you have an excess in your kidneys, get it out. And that system... And, you know, so as I said, I'm a big fan of all these people. The only criticism I have of any of them is their belief that they're doing it their way is all you need. And so because 
at one point I believed them and I tried it and it wasn't true. And I've spoken to many other people who are in the same position, right? And so that's that's all I'm trying to do here is not say anyone is wrong, but just expand on the other things that are also important if you are a follower of one of these people. And so, yeah, uh, getting rid of those excesses. Uh, I think there's a little bit of focus on um, environmental stuff, a little bit of focus on deficiencies, um, I've, yeah, a little bit of focus on pathogens among some people, although I'm pretty sure he doesn't really talk about it in his book, uh, Andreas Moritz. Um, but yeah, really the focus is on getting rid of excesses, the detoxification of the um, primary detoxification organs. And uh, next, the autoimmune protocol diet. Uh, yes, also known uh, commonly as the AIP diet. Um, so this is kind of a subdivision of the uh, paleo diet where... Um, not only are they removing all the stuff that paleo does, but they're basically removing all the foods which are considered to be the most likely to create an autoimmune response. Um, so this, you know, in addition to all the stuff that paleo removes, it's usually uh, removing nuts and seeds, um, removing dairy in many cases as well. So just getting rid of everything that your immune system tends to respond to. The idea behind it being that if your immune system doesn't have anything that's agitating it then it can calm down as it calms down the chronic systemic inflammation can go down as that goes down everything gets better that's the theory behind it again i'm a fan of it it's accurate in many cases but of course it is focusing specifically on um number three again the you know excesses of things which are irritating your immune system similar to uh, Dr. Gundry's system and if that is the root of your problem of course that will be a miracle for you but there may be other things going on um again there's a few diets yeah metabolic typing diet uh yes that's the one i was thinking of earlier that i was confusing um so the metabolic typing diet uh i again i believe in the kind of principles of that which are basically you know some people need uh more protein some people need more carbs some people need more fat and so they kind of break them down into different types and different body types and then within that there are kind of foods which are better, supposed to be better for some types and not others and all that kind of stuff. So again, as with a lot of the diets, I think this is primarily focused on uh, step two and step three, making sure you get enough of what you do need and not too much of the things that you can have too much of and not really that much focus on anything else. And the bulletproof diet. Bulletproof diet, uh, you know, was popular for a while. I know that, you know, the creator of it, Dave Asprey, has a very wide, eclectic range of focuses, probably including all of these, uh, you know, seven steps. But the diet, as far as I recall, having read the book, was pretty much just focused on, uh, primarily focused on getting mold out of your diet, making sure you don't eat foods that are high in mold, which would be an excess, which would be a toxin. So primarily focused on excesses, secondarily focused on um deficiencies which you know with the uh the mct oil and adding butter to your coffee and all that kind of craze um but the primary you know the bulletproof coffee the primary thing is not uh you know from reading his book the impression i got is not necessarily that coffee's so good although you know that was what most people took from it it was that normal non-bulletproof type coffee is so bad because it's full of mold so that's right. why you have to buy their coffee or other you know mold free coffee that was like so again the focus is really more than anything on reducing mold the toxins mm -hmm. yeah. okay um colonic hydrotherapy yeah so a fan of this uh actually certified in this um but again the focus of it is pretty much exclusively excesses you know removing toxicity um i think yeah i mean that's basically it right yeah i would think so i mean the only other thing potentially but then go down for argument environment pathogens and pathogens oh. yeah so you know. Pathogens. Some people do hydrotherapy talk a lot about removing pathogens. So we could definitely put that um, in the category. How would you see it connected to environment? Uh, well, you, well, the pathogens that are in the in the in the large intestine. So yeah, that's what it would be. Yeah, number six. Yeah, really. I think yeah. In, yeah. If it's internal environment, then yeah, yeah. So I think more um, pathogens. And we talked about this in the uh, chronic digestive infection episode. Uh, I yeah. You know, Obviously, if you can flush out the whole contents of the large intestine, which you can do clonic hydrotherapy, you are going to flush out the majority of pathogenic organisms along with every organism. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, they come back, um, but it can provide release, a relief. And in some people, it can actually uh, lead to resolution, as in your case, Chrissy. So, yeah, it certainly can be very helpful. Uh, Ayurvedic. 
Ayurvedic is another one that's actually pretty broad, I would say. Um, it doesn't focus on genetics because it's like a you know several thousand year old system. <laughs> genetics have only recently been discovered, but uh, it does focus on like understanding your constitutional type, shall we say, which is kind of genetics adjacent. In fact, I don't know if you know this, Chrissy, but we actually have um, a genetic insights reports on the free doshas from Ayurveda. No, I didn't know that now. That's great. Yeah. So are you Pitta? Are you Vata? Are you uh, Kapha? Like, do you have a higher chance of being each of those three? And again, mine was pretty accurate. Um, I show as having a typical likelihood of being Vata and um, Kapha and the uh, higher likelihood of being Pitta, which is exactly how I'm usually diagnosed by those practitioners. And what is it under for in the, is it just saying Ayurvedic? Um, I doesn't, it's not in any of the categories because it right. doesn't really fit into any of them. Yeah. Hopefully, eventually we'll have a whole category for types from other systems. But for now, uh, you would just find it uh, like by searching for each of the individual terms beautiful um, no that's like, great i love like how you're you're it. constantly upload you know bringing in new things it's wonderful it really is um, and again people would say well that's not even a real thing that's not very scientific Ellen. so again just to explain how we do this stuff all we say is you know it's uh, it's often based on surveys it's like have you been told you have an ayurvedic dota dosha yes what is it the person tells you then we look at how that correlates with the snips that they have and through that we can see there's a correlation People who self-report being Pitta are more likely to have these snips. That's that's all we do. It doesn't mean that there is such a thing actually as Pitta or Kapha or uh, uh, Vata. That's uh, you know a matter of contention. But our point is that people who identify as such um, have these snips. And I would say it does actually strengthen the case that these ancient systems are onto something, right? What I don't 100% agree with, honestly, with those systems is the dietary recommendations for those types. But I think it's fairly obvious that there are some types that are more, you know, uh, wiry and thin and anxious and uh, in their head. And there are some types that are more uh, inflamed and irritated and, um, and, and quick. And there are some types who are more kind of slow and congested and tend to be overweight, like... This is just something that is observable phenomena, and so I'm not surprised that we were able to see, uh, you know, genetic correlation um, for those types. Anyway, going back to the point, I have Ada. So it doesn't focus on genetics, but it does focus on deficiencies. It does focus on excesses. Um, even though you know it's not using endogenous uh, exogenous hormones or anything, like a lot of the herbs in Ayurveda are still focused on you know, altering the levels of those um, chemical cell signaling instructions. So you could argue it it does work on those. Obviously, in terms of lifestyle stuff, it's big in terms of whether it's the, the different massages that are part of the treatments or whether it's advocating yoga or getting up and looking at the sun first thing in the morning. All of that is kind of step five type stuff. Um, there is a focus on, again, treatments for pathogens, whether it's the various different cleansing regimes or the different herbs like neem and all the rest of it. Um, and even emotion and mindset. So this is not saying that, again, Ayurveda is the best system out there. As I said, I often don't really agree with the dietary recommendations, but I will acknowledge it's a pretty complete system that includes all of this that it could, given how old it is. And so it's not going to have genetics. But yeah, it's pretty pretty uh, complete. A red light and sauna therapy. Yeah, so um, I would put that firmly in the area of deficiencies. You know, we've up until now, we've taught uh, deficiencies mainly in terms of macro and micronutrients and maybe even the basic building blocks like oxygen, carbon. Um, but it's proven anything that if you completely restrict someone of it, it has a significant impact on their health. It proves that it is uh, something that is necessary. Now, the only question is do we put it in category two or uh, five you know is it a lifestyle factor or is it a deficiency um you know exercise is not like a thing and it's an activity so that's definitely more in step five light is it a thing i mean it kind of is it's a it's a frequency which is measurable which you can add or take away so ultimately i i still put it you know as a deficiency and I have observed that there are more and more people on the cutting edge of health who are proclaiming that a deficiency of light is actually like a root cause of uh, all kinds of health issues, uh, specifically 
uh, although not limited to its impact on primary chemical cell signaling instructions like hormones. Um, like there was one doctor who uh, talks about leptin being heavily controlled by uh, light signals and then leptin being the kind of primary hormone in the body that all the others are then influenced by in turn. So uh, I'm happy to put, you know, uh, what have you got on your list here? Red light and sauna in that category, but also uh, blue light first thing in the morning, like Andrew Huberman talks about. Uh, UV light, you know, we talk about we talk about vitamin D3, but, you know, that's really supposed to be created by uh, UV light, UVB light, as opposed to, you know, a supplement or anything like that. So in an ideal world. So, yeah, I would put all frequencies of light as simply in the area of um, deficiencies. Yeah, that's a really good point, because, I mean, most of us, I have to, I mean, I have animals, I have my two dogs, so I have to take them out for their walks. So, but there are days if I wouldn't, what, you know, didn't have to do those things with the amount of work or the schedule that I may have that I'm very limited of sometimes to go outside. So it's a really, really good, good point. Yeah. Having that under deficiencies and how important it is that we get those. Yeah. And you know, it's something that's, it's such a new problem because before the eventual electric light bulb, uh, even um, let's say if you didn't go outside and you're indoors all day, you'd still have some kind of light and the kind of light that you would have would be, you know, candlelight or firelight or whatever, or lamp, um, well, they, like, there's oil lamps. And the type of light that all those create is quite high in red light, you know? So our red light deficiency these days is purely down to the fact that we managed to invent electric light bulbs. And then we went from incandescent light bulbs to largely LED, which completely stripped away anything other than the blue frequency. So completely massively caused a, a red light deficiency. Wonderful. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> um, next, a traditional talk therapy. Um, so this would be entirely a step seven thing, I would say. Uh, I guess if you're talking about uh, psychotherapy, in other words, meaning... Um, psychiatrists people who prescribe drugs we could also look at them being a step four you know like if they're giving you ssris or whatever then they are um adjusting the levels of hormones and neurotransmitters but if it is purely talk then that is purely step seven purely uh, emotions in mind and uh, homeopathy so this is probably a little bit controversial depends if you believe in homeopathy um if you do not believe in homeopathy, then it is purely a step seven thing. It is a placebo. It is something that may be extremely effective and genuinely healing, but it's doing so through the power of belief. If you do believe in it, um, then you would say that it's working on the level of, huh, I mean, I'm quite familiar with the, the theory behind it because I'm just trying to simplify. I guess deficiency or, or excesses, right? In the case of an excess, the belief is if you give a minute quantity of a poison, so quite a few of the homeopathic remedies are extremely diluted poisons, and the idea is by giving your body such a low level of the poison, it gives the body the frequency of the poison, it helps the body deal with the poison. But, you know, basically that's still kind of saying it's a deficiency of a frequency. So <laughs> ultimately I'd say the theory of it is deficiencies, probably the reality is more emotions and mindset. And uh, TCM. Um, so TCM is, you know, potentially very broad in its kind of original um, incarnation of the kind of Taoist system that's behind it. But in the way that it tends to be practiced these days, I see it's pretty much if you go to a TCM practitioner, no matter what they understand of these seven steps, they're basically doing two things: they're doing acupuncture and herbs. Sometimes a bit of red light treatment or something as well, um, but that's that's pretty much you know it. Um, and so I'd say acupuncture I'd put as firmly step five. It's an outside thing that's um, giving cell signal instructions, releasing endorphins, stuff like that. Um, herbs are either going to be working in the area of deficiencies of giving nutrients. They're going to be working in the area of excesses, like for instance if they're a laxative, clearing stuff out. Or they're going to be working in the level of pathogens if they are killing um, organisms. So potentially working on two, three, and six, um, usually working on step five. And hypnotherapy. Uh, back to step seven only. Right, Belief, yeah. and belief emotions, and mindset. And IV therapy. Uh, step two. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, just deficiencies, uh, except for if it's a, I guess, IV ozone or IV um, 
maybe you could argue NAD+, IV um, uh, chelation therapy, IV glutathione, in which case it would be something to address excesses. That would be the other thing, a step-free thing. Okay, cool. Yeah, that, I mean, that's that's pretty much our list. It's nice to have something to compare it to, to be able to see, oh, okay, that makes sense of where in the rejuvenation blueprint all of these these things do fit. So um, now we're moving into... And, and, oh, and go just ahead. Clarify, these are just things that we thought of really off the top of our head without much time. There probably are other popular systems that uh, didn't occur to either of us. Uh, so if it's something really obscure and niche, then probably keep it to yourself. But if there's any big thing that you think I've missed please feel free to again put it in the comments on YouTube and I'll happily tell you which steps I think it fits into. And just before you go to the next thing, Chrissy, just to like um, emphasize the point of that to go through was not to comment on anyone else's system. It was just to explain that all the things that you may well already be familiar with, we tried to pick the well-known things that hopefully most people listening are familiar with, like they already are working on these different steps. Um, so it's not as if anything that I'm saying is necessarily new all, the only difference to the rejuvenation blueprint is it's bringing all seven steps together, which, as you saw based on the list we just gave, is pretty rare. You know, I said sometimes Ayurveda focuses on all seven, sometimes functional medicine focuses on all seven. But though, if you actually see a practitioner of each of those, they're not necessarily going to focus on all seven. But at least you know it's within their training to do so overall. Um, but to say you know all of these systems have value, but they're only part of the puzzle, and that's why if they did work for you, great. But if they didn't work or if they only partially worked, it's probably not because there's something wrong with them, but because they're not covering everything. Yes, very good point. Very good point. And that's what we're trying to do here is bring it, bring awareness to everyone of like, ah, there could be a, a missing piece of the puzzle and maybe it's this. So as we move into the next section, we're really just discussing, you know, different things uh, that people may be dealing with. And so the first one that I have on my list here is weight gain, because as we know, that is a something that a lot of people are dealing with and it could potentially be so many different things mm. yeah and so we talked we've done a whole episode on this as well so so the point of this is if you're suffering with any of these i'm not going to give an exhaustive list because it's, you know in most cases we've really done a full episode on it or we're going to do a full episode on it the point was more to sh to give you an example to say no matter what your health challenge is or no matter what your health goal is here is a way of using the system to either ask yourself questions or to ask your doctor questions, ideally, or your practitioner questions, or if you're not doing that, to ask Google questions, to, you know, whatever search engine you're using, ask YouTube questions, ask TikTok questions, however it is that you seek out information, uh, ask, you know, ChatGPT or Claude or like, it's, it's <laughs> personally the least favorite of those. I'd rather go to TikTok than AI, honestly, because AI is extremely bad for health advice it's the most mainstream um edited sanitized possible answer you can get so i'm not a fan but anyway some people do it no matter what i say so it's like a prompt for you to wherever you go to for information to start asking the right questions if that makes sense so let's say all right i'm starting to gain weight I don't understand it. Maybe I'm not eating anymore or not more than usual. Maybe I'm not exercising less or no less than usual. That's pretty much all I know. Okay, so what do I do? So the first question I'll ask myself is, is there a genetic component to this, right? Do I have a genetic tendency to be overweight? Now, the simple way of doing that is just to look at your parents and go, oh, they're both overweight. I suppose I will be inevitably as well, or maybe not or whatever. But of course, it's not as simple as that. You can have both parents who are one thing and you're not and vice versa. And so ideally, it's actually, again, looking at genetic reports for a company like ours and seeing, is there a genetic tendency to be overweight? Um, you know, for, for me, for instance, I, I had been underweight my whole life and I saw my genetic report and it said that I didn't have a tendency to be underweight. I always assumed it was genetic because my father was always underweight. I was always underweight. So I, was like, oh, I must have just taken after him, right? Just logical. I get my genetic report and it says there is no tendency to be underweight or overweight. You have a tendency to be in the middle. Um, and then once I started to resolve my digestive issues, suddenly I'm normal weight. I'm not underweight or overweight anymore. So it just showed it wasn't a genetic thing, but it could have been. And so that's the first thing to you know, either validate or rule out. So once we've answered that question, we can move on to deficiencies. Is there any kind of nutritional deficiencies that are leading to me um, to uh, gain weight? It's not likely, but it is possible. And the way that it's possible in my experience is 
Um, if there's a nutrient missing, that can be a reason why we keep eating beyond the point that we should stop because we feel like iron not satiated. The most common example of that that's talked about the most is simply protein or more specifically amino acids. Usually if you eat a much higher protein diet, it's much more difficult to overeat because you feel more satiated. And we've talked about this in other episodes, how especially with individual amino acids, there are often people who are deficient in one or more amino acids, and it can create a lot of problems. And so making sure that you get enough protein can help you not overeat. So that's an example, but it could be any number of nutrients. Um, is there some kind of excess? You know, this is a little bit complicated, but... Um, Certainly, there can be specific poisons which are slowing down your metabolism. For instance, there can be specific poisons that are, you know, causing you to be hyperthyroid. There can be specific poisons which um, are causing you to increase your appetite even by messing with uh, leptin sensitivity, for instance, which is the satiety hormone. So that's something you can investigate. And again, these are all questions, right? Doctor, Google, YouTube, GPT, whatever it might be. Um, what nutritional deficiencies cause weight gain? What uh, toxins cause weight gain? Like to start thinking, could this be it? Could this be what's going on? Uh, next one, hormones. I mean, you know, often that would be my p personal starting point with this. <laughs> um, and what can, hormones specifically? Uh, thyroid, uh, really all of them. Cortisol can lead to weight gain. Um, oxytocin can lead to weight gain in excess, so that's rare. Excess estrogen can lead to weight gain. That's extremely common. Insulin resistance can lead to weight gain. That's extremely common. Um, progesterone will uh, cause you to lose weight. Having optimal levels of T3. Um, the active thyroid hormone will cause you to optimize your weight. Um, testosterone will cause you to uh, lose fat, although potentially gain muscle weight if you have enough of it. Growth hormone will cause you to hold on to muscle but lose fat weight. Um... DHEA, I think, um, has some degree of impact, but not significant. But yeah, still, I'm trying to just go through all the hormones. Most of the hormones have a significant effect on weight. So knowing what your genetic tendency is with those hormones, and then knowing what your actual level is with those hormones, doing, uh, I prefer blood tests, some practitioner saliva tests. Ideally, you have both, so you can compare. Uh, can absolutely you know, give you the answers. Lifestyle factors, of course, that's the normal thing that most people focus on in terms of not enough exercise or overeating. Um, but could be, you know, we just talked about light earlier. What's your light environment? Maybe you're getting too much blue light, not enough red light that can mess with your hormone levels, which can ultimately lead to you gaining weight and not being able to keep it off. Um, maybe too much stress, you know, that again impacts hormones, maybe not enough sleep, you know, all of these kind of things need to be investigated, all the lifestyle things need to be investigated. Uh, chronic infections, it's absolutely shown that, you know, some of uh, the overweight people tend to have a different microbiome than, you know, optimally weighted people. And so there may well be some kind of unpleasant uh, organisms somewhere usually the digestive tract that is maybe not causing weight gain but making it more difficult to lose weight i think that's more likely so that's something that you can investigate and of course emotions and mindset is a big one um it can be you know it's like a psychological method uh, mechanism that's talked about a lot where holding extra weight is like a buffer that protects you from the outside world people who've had um sa i don't want to say it I don't yeah know if you're no to it's say just it. thinking that uh, exactly our um, defense mechanism maybe more likely to do that to again keep people away um put on weight without realizing it um it can be you know so any kind of abuse really it can be a way of like creating a, a buffer potentially to um keep people away from you so um there could be you know, beliefs as i said like if both your parents are overweight you might just believe that it's inevitable for me and that belief will stop you from losing weight there's all kinds of things that it could be and again it's like a whole avenue that you need to investigate this sounds like a minefield this one because it could be anything i love how you ran through each of them but then you're like okay well wait a minute elwin <laughs> that's a lot <laughs> where do, but where do where do i start and i would say start at the top with number one genetics yeah. Yeah, start at the top as a general, and I've kind of highlighted that one. I think I personally would also start with hormones, as that's so crucial with you know how hungry you are and how much 
your metabolism burns energy and whether you hold on to fat and where you hold on to fat, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it is a minefield. The point of it, though, is not to overwhelm people. The point of it is really more, because I know the kind of person that we're dealing with is usually not the debutante. It's usually not the beginner. It's the person who believes that they've tried everything and nothing's worked. And so that's really who I'm talking to here more. It's like, you haven't tried everything because... As you just said, Chrissy, when you hear all of those things, you're like, oh my God, there's loads of things I haven't tried, right? That's really the point. Now, exactly out of those so many options, which you decide to narrow in on and prioritize and start with, that's a judgment call that you may do based on what you hear me say, what you hear someone else say, what you hear a doctor say, what, again, what Dr. Google says or whatever. Like, I'm not... This is not about telling you what to focus on specifically, more to show you how if you think you're out of options or out of ideas, there's almost certainly not just techniques or therapies or whatever that you haven't tried. There's whole categories of them that you may not have even tried or looked at or focused on. And that's uh, the main goal of this episode to give examples of that. Beautiful. No, I'm, I love that we're doing this. Um, our next one on the list, and I know we've done a few other episodes uh, pertain to this one as well, diabetes. Yeah, so I'll go through these more quickly now, otherwise uh, this will be a 10-hour episode, uh, or I'll try to at least. Uh, but yeah, are there genetic factors? Uh, there may well be in, you know, yeah, because there's type one and type two diabetes. So, like, w w if we want to focus on this, then you know, do we want to specifically focus on type two or type one or both? Uh, I'd say type two because type one you really know there's genetics. You know, this is something that you're born with. Um, yeah, but type two there may still be genetic factors, even though it's thought of as only type one. Uh, definitely. So, you know, that's significant. Deficiencies, uh, chromium is often looked at, but there's magnesium, there's uh, zinc, there's the B vitamins, biotin. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of different things that potentially can be uh, contributing to insulin resistance and then insulin resistance contributes to diabetes. So it's like it's early in the chain. Um, I don't believe that once you already have full blown type 2 diabetes that only resolving nutritional deficiencies would be enough but it's still something that I would look at that may be helpful to some degree um, excesses absolutely could be there are certain poisons which um, negatively impact the uh, effectiveness of the pancreas and there are certain poisons which block the insulin receptor which you know create that situation of insulin resistance so they are certainly worth looking into i'm not going into much detail because we did several episodes on this not long ago that you can link to chrissy please um so chemical cells signal instructions again hormones you know uh, we talked about leptin, the satisfaction hormone, ghrelin, the hunger hormone, insulin, the uh, bl uh, the sugar transport hormone. But the other hormones, your testosterone, progesterone, estrogen, and all the rest of it, impact those hormones. And so, you know, understanding how all of those are doing may give you uh, clues about how to reverse the situation. Oh, just to go back to deficiencies, while deficiencies may not resolve type 2 diabetes they can make a really big difference with neuropathy which is one of the most unpleasant experiential parts of uh, diabetes uh b1 specifically if you have enough b1 that especially uh benfotiamine which is a fat soluble version of b1 that's been shown to be very effective for helping with uh, neuropathy as an example so nutritional deficiency are definitely still worth looking into even if they on their own may not be curative um Lifestyle and events also is a question. Is there any lifestyle and environmental um, factors? Well, of course, you know, this is known for diabetes. That, that, that That's certainly the case. Um, exactly what you want to change is a little bit more controversial when we go into that in more detail again in the episode where we talk about that. Uh, pathogens, it's worth asking the question. Uh, there may be an infection of the pancreas, which is significantly impacting the function of it, but that is... Um, extremely rare and as I understand it would only ever happen if it's acute so I don't believe I've heard people say that that's a factor but I don't think that's been scientifically proven but still if you're if you're trying every avenue that's something you may want to consider and then emotions and mindset can for every single thing can always be the thing if you believe that you're not going to get better then 
all the stuff that works on other people might still not work on you because whatever you deeply believe you will often manifest at least within your own body if not maybe in your life right yeah i mean that is one of the biggest parts and as we have discussed previously and as dr joe talks about as well that this can really be a key of how you believe what you believe how you think and everything else and that, that could be the one thing that's in your way beautiful um the next on the list is crohn's disease yeah, so that's uh, an inflammation of the uh, intestinal lining, I believe, that is um, considered to be autoimmune. So I say considered to be because I think it's potentially that there's other things going on, so let's go through the list. Um, is there a genetic tendency towards it? There may well be. Um, we do have a report on this genetic insight. So again, that doesn't mean that you're stuck with it, but... If you have a much higher risk of having this than other people, it means maybe you can let yourself off the hook to some degree emotionally that you've ended up with it. It, it was always more likely to happen to, to you than others. And then you can look at the recommendations to see what would actually help with your situation given your genetics. Um, deficiencies potentially, uh, if it is autoimmunity, then it's a dysfunction of the immune system. What causes a dysfunction in the immune system? Could be many things. It could be a lack of specific nutrients. Zinc is, you know, one of many examples. Vitamin D3 is another one that um, are claimed that if you optimize them, it can reduce the um, level of autoimmunity. Excesses, why is your immune system overly stimulated in the first place? It may well be a toxin. It may well be an excess level of something which has irritated your immune system and got it to start reacting to other things it may well be a chronic infection to skip ahead for a second to step six that um, is causing your immune system to become overly reactive to shift it from the regulatory interleukins being dominant to the um, inflammatory uh, interleukins being dominant so that's something that is worth looking at it it's i know this is a bit of a controversial thing to say but it could be Something like toenail fungus or gum disease or sinus infection or whatever could actually, if it goes on long enough, tip, if you already have, especially if you already have the genetic tendency, tip your immune system over the edge to the point where it starts, you know, reacting to things. And if that goes on long enough, that could end up with any number of autoimmune situations, including Crohn's. Um, and lifestyle and environmental f oh sorry uh yeah chemical cell signaling instructions again hormones and neurotransmitters have a significant impact on the immune system so obviously optimizing that could help uh, one thing i'd certainly start with in that category would be thyroid for instance um, there's a definite connection between underactive thyroid and overactive uh, immune system uh, lifestyle and environmental factors, obviously, things like not sleeping enough and stress are, have a negative effect on the immune system. And then, as always, a uh, belief <laughs> that I'm meant to suffer or I deserve this or I'll never be better or any of those things can stop you healing. Beautiful. I mean, yeah, because I mean, the, the, sometimes with sort of some of these, I think people can think that that's it that there's nothing else I can do. So what I like about this is maybe there is something else, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe there is something else that an individual could investigate further and could potentially, you know, find, find more of a solution for themselves. And that's why we spent so long listing some of the other ones as well. Not that we put a huge amount of thought. This is not our definitive list of the best possible systems out there, but it is suggestions of things that Chris, you know, between Chrissy and I, at least one of us, probably often both of us are a fan of because they may, you know, so if you're like, oh, I don't even know where to start with, you know, mindset, well, maybe consider Dr. Dispenser's work, maybe consider talk therapy, maybe consider hypnotherapy, maybe consider some of the stuff that I talked about with Step 7. You know, if you don't know where to start with, uh, you know, toxins and excesses, maybe consider uh, Dr. Clark, consider Andreas Moritz, consider Dr. Gundry, consider autoimmune protocol. Do you see what I mean? Like we're actually giving you systems where if there's, if you know very little about it, then these are systems that you can dig into and, and really expand your knowledge and, and find out if, uh, if that may be, you know, relevant for whatever your, whatever your focus is, whatever your issue is. Uh, moving on into the next one, which is depression. Yeah, so that's something that, you know, most people would only focus on step seven, right? Emotions and mindset. Is there some kind of, you know, trauma? Is there some kind of, you know, 
cognitive behavior therapy? Is there some kind of pattern of negative thinking? Is there some kind of neurological habit or whatever? Or on the other end of the scale, I guess they might think of genetics. Uh, you know, do I have a high tendency to be depressed? Maybe my mother was depressed, my father was depressed, whatever. And both of those are relevant and good questions to ask. But there's other questions to ask. Could there be some kind of deficiency that's leading to uh, the depression? I would say absolutely yes. Um, I feel like the combination of, I'll say it this way. I don't believe it is possible to feel depressed for any significant length of time that it would significantly reduce the quality of your life if you have optimized your levels of T3 and dopamine. So uh, notice the way I phrase that. I didn't say yes. that it's the only cause. Yes. I realize your depression may be because of your life circumstances. I realize your depression may be because of horrific things that happened to you in your past. I realize it may be because of past lives, if you believe in that. Whatever it is, but what I'm saying is if you optimize your level of T3, which is active thyroid hormone, if you optimize your level of dopamine, the T3 will give you an overflow of joyful energy the dopamine will give you that motivation, drive, passion, and enthusiasm to, to get stuff done in life. Maybe also the GABA to keep you calm and relaxed and, and centered and, and maybe not overstimulated. If you have those things in place, it's very hard to like really committedly stick to the, perce the perception of I can't get out of bed, life is futile, everything is pointless, that kind of thing that you do believe when you are depressed i may as well end it all all of that kind of stuff that's not possible when you have those things at such an optimized place i'm not saying that those things are necessarily the cause although they might be i just saw a study recently that 93 percent of people who uh, were diagnosed as either moderately depressed or severely depressed um their symptoms resolved in the uh, context of having sufficient levels of T3 therapy. T3, again, being thyroid hormone. So again, it's 93%, not 100%. There's always exceptions. Um, T3 therapy doesn't work on a lot of things, including doesn't necessarily fix dopamine, the other thing that I said. Um, but it just goes to show you, if you have enough just cellular energy, it's pretty hard to be depressed for too long, no matter what's going on in your life. Um, and, you know, there are things that affirm it. I've talked before about A Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, you know, a man stuck in the most horrific circumstances imaginable who still kept a positive mindset and, you know, throughout, and it saved his life many times. And this is an example that no matter how bad our circumstances are, if our inner world is in a good position, then it's amazing what we are able to go through without it uh, ruining us, crushing us, pushing us towards you know, futility and all the rest of it. And and if anyone's like feeling like I'm not empathizing or understanding, I'm sorry. My understanding though is, I, I realize it's not a choice, right? Like depression, but my understanding is it's really like a black hole of lack of energy. I don't think there's anyone who's would consider themselves depressed who feels an overflowing of energy within them. That's something that I'm certain of. And so that's really the thing that I'd focus on. So anyway, back to the list. Are there deficiencies of something which is, causing a lack of that overflowing of energy are the excesses of something that are causing a lack of that overflowing of energy and yes i would be looking at energy and mitochondrial function as well as um which is why i say t3 as well as looking at dopamine and so you know deficiency of maybe tyrosine or magnesium or some of the b vitamins or zinc in relation to dopamine or you know um, any of the building blocks related to you know, vitamin b3 b1 in relation to energy production any of that Excesses, any kind of toxin can potentially prevent energy production. Certain um, pharmaceuticals can as well. Yes, toxicities of many kind of uh, pharmaceuticals. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and including recreational drugs would be in that category as well. Um, chemical cell signal instructions. Yeah, sorry, I don't often think of that because I'm assuming the person's already doing all everything that they think they can do. But you're right, especially in the context of depression, uh, a lot of people are just doing what they need to to feel you know, they can bear life. I completely understand that. And, you know, pharmaceuticals and recreational drugs may well be on that list, but they may well be making it worse. Um, yeah, hormones, obviously, we talked about lifestyle. You know, people who say if you're depressed, then just like going out there and helping other people is a significant uh, impact a lot of time. I think that's true. People who say just going out there and exercising will make you feel significantly better. I think that's true if you're 
physically capable and you know emotionally capable of it um it definitely helps a hard day's work definitely uh, reduces depression if you can manage to actually do it um so all of that stuff you know needs to be looked at as potential causes uh pathogens there this might sound like a no again like the previous one but actually um there is evidence that different uh chronic infections especially will significantly contribute to all kinds of mental health issues despite what i just said about t3 and dopamine dopamine is a neurotransmitter you know there's more and more understanding that dope that neurotransmitter deficiency is not necessarily cause of depression um and that it's actually like inflammation is a bigger factor than used to be before and so chronic infections are something that can definitely contribute to inflammation yeah i remember Um, a while ago i think i read a book called brain on fire and yeah and so it was this uh, this young girl that you know she couldn't she's having erratic behavior everything like that and it was there was an infection something with the autoimmune i can't remember what is something in there but that that was the cause of it and so so yeah that's a very good you know you wouldn't automatically go there so that's why I like you, you know, it's like, okay, run through all of the steps, no matter what, see where it takes you. And I still talked about T3 first, because again, if you optimize T3, then often um, your body's able to deal with those chronic infections. And often if you don't, then your body's not able to, no matter what you do. Um, but sometimes you need to optimize T3, and then you still need to deal with the chronic infection, <laughs> but your body can't handle it on its own. Um, and so that still needs to be dealt with. Uh, yeah, so I think that's all seven. Yeah, perfect. And then, yeah, and then step seven, I I, you did touch on that, you know, and so, yeah, so again, so valid to go through each one of these steps. Beautiful. And then uh, next, ADHD. Uh, Yes, I think we talked about, you know, this before, there's a a few different things. I, you know, fundamentally, I would say it's a step four thing. It's, it's often thought of as a lack of dopamine, because drugs that increase dopamine, like amphetamines, the legal amphetamines, well, you know, be the most effective drugs to help a person not feel that way. Um, but, you know, there can be other things. So Dr. Platt, who we had on a while ago, talks about how really it's an excess of adrenaline. And he likes, you know, progesterone, as well as often T3, DHEA. Um, I think those are the main ones. Oh, and if necessary for men, testosterone. And if you optimize those different things, he finds that's highly effective. Um of course, there could be other reasons why all those hormones are out of place in the first place and neurotransmitters like dopamine. Uh, it could be genetic reasons, going back through the list, that we need to find out about and compensate for if it is there. It could be nutritional deficiencies, which are leading, or even other things like light deficiencies, as we talked about, um, that can lead to uh, that imbalance and lack of dopamine and imbalance of neurotransmitters. Um, could be excesses of any kind of toxin, which is blocking the creation or maintaining a balance of any of those hormones and neurotransmitters could be lifestyle factors in fact uh, impacting those hormones and neurotransmitters could be chronic infections indirectly impacting the creation of those hormones and neurotransmitters because often um, chronic infections create a lot of toxins which brings us back to step three which then block the optimal levels of those hormones and of course emotions and mindset uh adhd can also be a defense mechanism from not wanting to feel certain feelings that's why a person you know struggles so hard to focus so that could be a fruitful area of explanation and obviously i'm trying to just go through these quickly just to giving examples but the point is not to know all the answers and i'm not claiming to know all the answers with any of these or certainly if i did i wouldn't be showing it here because it would take far too long But the point is just to give examples to get you thinking, to like prompt you to start thinking, oh yeah, what deficiencies could it be for me? What toxins could it be for me? What hormones and neurotransmitters could it be for me? So uh, is it starting to, with these examples, is it starting to make sense, Chrissy, how you deploy? Yeah, absolutely, definitely. It's, you know, going over in this regard, especially with each of these case by case is like looking at it, but you know, there's still, we're doing one through seven, but you're looking at it from a different point of view. And you're also going, Oh, actually I never thought about that. That could be linked with that. So no, this is very helpful. And I'm trying to go through and we'll do more to show you. You may not think that all seven of these factors could be related, but you know, I think we've only come up with one example so far where one of them is less likely to be related. Like they all can be related in most cases 
directly or indirectly, and they're all worth looking into in most, most cases um, and exploring the possibility of it. It's pretty rare um, where it's not. Even where you'd think depression, you think, oh, that's just a mental issue or maybe a genetic thing. But no, 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 it could be a chronic infection, you know, or whatever. Like the, <laughs> even when you think it's like diabetes, oh, that must be, you know, a nutritional issue or something. No, 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 it could be. So like it's always broader than you think. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So this is why this is valuable. Um, the next one we've got on the list is anxiety. I mean, there's a lot of that in today's society, especially with our, you know, with the younger generations out there. Yeah. And so, you know, because of that, it's very easy to think about um, lifestyle factors first, right? So the social media and all the social pressures and uh, uh, you know, the media and all of that kind of stuff. And, the, you know, the light environment, the blue light all the time and the noisiness. And, you know, you maybe if you're living in a city, you're coming across thousands of people every day who might be trying to hurt you and you don't know. Whereas throughout most of my history, you would, you would never, you know, you'd only see a stranger once in a blue moon. Like there are so many lifestyle factors these days that lend themselves to anxiety. And we talk a lot about that uh, in the stress episode, so I won't belabor that. So that's the obvious stuff to most people. But then there's all the stuff that's not obvious that is also worth looking at. So is there a genetic tendency? There's strong genetic tendency in many cases towards anxiety, which needs to be acknowledged. Some people will just never be as relaxed and easygoing as others because of, uh, you know, strong genetic types. And then it's, you know, still but you want to reduce it but you also just want to accept yourself as you are you know i'm always going to be a bit less resilient i'm always going to be a bit more anxious than the super uh you know secure and comfortable and relaxed person and that's okay yeah absolutely um, like we talked about in the big five <laughs> and things like that where are you on the on the list and you know so of course yes yeah, some people just are more neurotic which means more of a tendency to uh focus on and fixate on uh, painful feelings, negative feelings. And uh, you can work on that with all the therapies and systems in the world to reduce it. And you probably should for your well being. But you should never compare yourself to someone else and say, I should be like them, because we're all different. And that's the helpful thing to understand from genetics. So understanding genetics can definitely help. Um, and of course, you know, with our genetic reports, like we have one for anxiety, there's a bunch of recommendations specific to your, to your DNA. So that's always helpful as well. Uh, deficiencies, you know, most commonly, most obviously for anxiety is magnesium. I think a lot of people talk about that, but there's a bunch of others like B vitamins. And then there's a bunch of others that you might not think about because, you know, we talked about this, with, I think an episode that will have come out or will come out about Wilson syndrome, how um, thyroid function, can significantly impact uh, anxiety, for instance. We did another episode a while ago about how levels of progesterone will significantly impact uh, anxiety. We did another episode a while ago about how pro uh, progesterone, about how testosterone and DHT will significantly impact anxiety. So any of those hormones um, and many others, uh, deficiencies like a lack of glycine can lead to anxiety, a lack of... Um, uh, let's see if I can remember anything else off the top of my head. Maybe not. Oh, pro yeah, uh, proline perhaps as well. Um, you know, L-theanine, although it's not a central nutrient, that can really help with anxiety. So is there anything that I could do with more of that would help? Is there anything excess that's causing it? You know, excess of mercury, excess of microtoxins, excess of lead, excess of cadmium are all uh, well known to contribute to anxiety. That's something if you have inexplicable anxiety that the answers aren't coming from other stuff, that could be something that's uh, definitely worth testing. Last off factors, they're kind of obvious. As I said, that's usually the first thing that people would think of. Uh, emotions and mindset factors, again, that would be what people would tend to think of, but um, that's worth looking into. For instance, if you have a belief Deep held, deeply held belief that the world is a scary place and you know your emotional state is unsafe, then of course you'll have anxiety. <laughs> and uh, you can work on it on that level, but as I said, maybe it's fruitful to work on the level of deficiencies or on the level of hormones or whatever, but you can also work on the level of the emotions themselves. And sometimes that's the best way of approaching it. Uh, pathogenic organisms. There are absolutely pathogens in your gut which create very large amounts of noradrenaline which is a stress chemical that create very uh, large amounts of serotonin, which can potentially be a stress chemical. 
Um, and so if you also have leaky gut, which often you do if you have those intestinal uh, chronic infections, then you can have large amounts of that neurotransmitter pouring into your bloodstream and affecting you. So could a chronic infection give you chronic anxiety? Absolutely it could. It can do it directly through the mechanism I just said, and it can do it indirectly by causing inflammation, which then causes this systemic inflammation, which then causes, again, the hormone and neurotransmitter imbalance. And that's just two mechanisms off the top of my head. There are probably many others, so definitely worth looking into chronic infections as well um, for anxiety. Wonderful. Yeah, and you wouldn't think about that. Again, that's what I'm saying. You wouldn't think that, oh, maybe it's a chronic infection because there's that knock-on effect in the gut. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, eczema. So we have talked and done things about skin previously, but yeah, so let's, if, you know, if somebody's really suffering with, let's say, eczema, well, how would they walk through the, the um, rejuvenation blueprint? Yeah, so I had a client with this just the other day. Um, so genetic factors are definitely worth looking into. For her, it was extremely helpful. Um, so deficiencies uh, with eczema, uh, light deficiencies are actually a big one. And uh, often actually the type of light that's considered unhealthy, you, so UV light for eczema and psoriasis can actually be uh, very uh, beneficial. UV is, you know, the one associated with the sun. It's the one that people try and block with sunglasses or with... Uh, uh, what's it called? Um, the, the stuff that people rub on, the, rub on their skin, the I, sunscreen. Thank you that I never use. Um, <laughs> so that uh, will block UV light, but that will also then block the healing capacity that that UV light has. So UV does burn. You don't want to have an excess of it. But UV is also the stuff that stimulates the production of vitamin D, which, if we look at the area of deficiencies, that's another thing. Deficiency of which can. Uh, contribute to or even cause um, eczema or psoriasis. Um, red light, a lack of red light can also potentially do it. Um, and then all kinds of other nutrients like vitamin E is another one that's you know commonly talked about. Um, um, you just mentioned for the previous client, you said that looking at her genetic factors was very helpful. Can you just elaborate just a tiny touch on that for her eczema? Yeah, because uh, I started talking about UV light and sunlight um, as being the first thing that came to my mind to help with that and vitamin D. But I didn't have any, like, it's just one of many things someone could try. But then when we looked at their genetic reports, it was literally the first thing that was recommended for them. Um, and so I think that's, you know, it was helpful to um, see that for them it was actually, you know, the factor that for... Because obviously we're not just evaluating one SNP when we tell someone they have a higher chance of eczema or psoriasis or anything else we're evaluating many SNPs so it just turned out that the SNPs that for that person indicated that they had a higher chance that would be more helped by UV light specifically right so, so in that in that genetic insights report for eczema it showed according and, to her yeah, it showed, yeah and vitamin d3 sorry but both right. of them relate to sunlight yeah. right 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 so it showed that that within within the recommendations those were the top ones okay perfect yeah that makes sense thank you yeah, yeah. And so, you know, it's not always as simple and helpful as that with genetic reports, uh, to be honest, but it often is. And so it was in that case. Um, so, yeah, so it could be a lack of light, could be a lack of all kinds of nutrients, excesses. Um, absolutely, if you have an excess of toxicity that is overburdening your kidneys and your liver, then your body will try and push it out through your skin. And this can then irritate your skin that your body has a layer of immune system on the skin to keep the anything from coming in that it doesn't want to come in but that immune barrier can also be irritated by a bunch of toxins that are trying to go the other way that are trying to go out and that can cause inflammation so that's another potential factor um so that's the kind of autoimmunity like a potential cause for autoimmunity it could be a chronic infection just to skip ahead again um it could be you know a fungal infection or a viral or whatever else which again will lead to that inflammatory condition so you know toxins or pathogens are potential culprits um, it could be hormonal of course that is a factor that's why for women sometimes it will be worse at one time of the month than another time of the month that's why you know teenagers it can often be worse uh during a you know a certain hormonal peak so we can look into that is there an excess of something is there a deficiency of something uh, lifestyle factors, 
Um, you know, if you keep scratching it, if you keep <laughs> irritating it, uh, maybe your clothing, maybe some chemicals on your clothing are irritating it, all of that kind of stuff. So that all needs to be investigated. You could call that an excess, but I'm kind of categorize excess as more as things that are go inside the body. If it's something on your body, but not going inside, then I put it more in step five, but I guess it's arbitrary. But uh, yeah, anything that may be external to you, but that may still be causing it, I, I classify as kind of a step five thing. Um, and of course, stress. Most people know that, and in fact, it was the case with this person that it first started when they had a period of significant stress in their life and this eczema manifested and then it kind of never went away again. And so um, that's definitely something to look at with emotions and mindset as well. Um, is there some kind of uh, emotional basis behind it? I've seen that quite often with skin conditions. Um, some people, you know, they have like an irritation where they keep scratching it and getting really irritated by it. Some people, they get like an anxiety around it and they're kind of panicking around it. And um, I often believe that that if it's not the root of the issue, then it's kind of like it's correlated and uh, it's really helpful for the person to also look at the uh, emotions which are correlated to it. And it's possible, and I've heard this feedback from people, that if they use, say, a medication to suppress it that it'll just show up somewhere else and the feelings will come right back and almost feels like it is a way for those feelings to come to the surface so not saying that's the only cause i also believe that there has to be a physical component for it to happen it's my belief but i'm saying it's like a correlation like it it, it, it goes together within the body mind yeah absolutely and you brought up a very good point that suppression it's um, you know my thoughts around that would be that it would just push whatever the issue is deeper and the body's always looking for a way out anyway so it's going to come out it's going to come out or show up somewhere yeah it depends what it is um you know it depends what the cause of it is again but if it's most of what I just talked about, then yes, absolutely. <laughs> in most cases, yes. Not always. Some people, they just put a bit of cortisone cream and it goes away and never comes back. I mean, it does happen, but uh, it's not as common as it, <laughs> as you say, reoccurring. We're going to take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today. Oh, next on the list is, oh, one of the joys of life, belly fat. Aha. Uh -huh. Yes. Let's look at this one. <laughs> so we talked about weight already. So I'll be really specific with belly fat. You know, we do have a belly fat uh, genetic report. So there could be a genetic factor that means that you specifically have that tendency, even if you don't have a general tendency to be overweight. So that's something that's worth uh, looking into. If we're talking about belly fat as opposed to other fat, we are usually talking about insulin resistance. And so we also report on insulin resistance and, you know, other insulin markers. So I'd look at that. And then I would consider all the factors related to that. So are the deficiencies leading to insulin resistance? Are there excesses leading to insulin resistance? Are there other hormonal balances leading to insulin resistance? Are there other lifestyle factors leading to insulin resistance? Um, are there other, uh, are there any um, chronic infections that are leading to insulin resistance? Probably, again, not directly, but easily indirectly, because chronic infections can lead to increased toxicity and increased inflammation. Increased toxicity and inflammation can go back to affecting everything else. Um, and then, yeah, as always, an emotional mindset, belief factor, um, 
can be, you know, we talked about that earlier, weight gain. Well, it can be specifically around the belly as well. Although, honestly, I'd say that's less common. If it is an emotional belief mindset factor, it tends to be more universal. Whereas if it's belly specific, it really is, in my experience, more specifically uh, related to insulin resistance. Good points. And does cortisol play a role in, in belly fat as well, too? Yeah, within yeah, that space, definitely, yeah, definitely one of the hormones, um, but not the only one. You know, it's th thyroid and progesterone and testosterone and estrogen and serotonin and it's the whole list again. <laughs> right, <laughs> They're right, relevant right. Relevant for all of it. And then, so another one on the list here, you know, there's a you know hip and thigh fat, and specifically as well, you know, just kind of in those areas where women tend to struggle, like cellulite, those kind of things, where there's a lot of proliferation there. Yeah, so cellulite's a different one. I don't know enough about it, um, but if I wanted to find out about it, I would run through my list. So <laughs> I would ask other genetic factors. I don't think we have a report for it yet, but um, since we do, I will let people know. Um, I would look into are there, are there nutritional deficiencies that can contribute to cellulite? Um, I would look into other excesses that can le uh, lead to cellular. I would look into, I won't go through the list, but you get the idea. That's, I would do the same investigation. Um, for like thigh and hip fat, usually if it's specifically that and not so much anything else, just like with the belly fat, if it's specifically that and not so much other things, we look more at estrogen, right? As you say, it's more common with women. Um, and so uh, we would go through the list again for estrogen specifically and estrogen dominance. Um, so it's not just the level of estrogen in your blood, but it's the relation of estrogen to other markers like progesterone uh, or like testosterone, which is the most important thing. So I'd look at, you know, deficiencies that could be related to excess estrogen. I'd look at excesses. Um, excesses could be, so estrogen, while it's a natural hormone, it's something that your body has to detoxify to stop it becoming excessive. And so if your body's already... If your detoxification capacity, especially around uh, glucuronidation, which is a one of the methods that your body uses to detoxify things, is already overburdened with other toxins that your body processes in the same way, then that can lead to the buildup of estrogen. So that would be worth looking into. Um, obviously, hormones, other hormones, they're all interrelated. Uh, we talked about this in great detail on other um, episodes, but... You know, estrogen tends to come together with a bunch of hormones and it's opposed by a bunch of other hormones. In fact, let's go through the list. So the hormones that tend to go with excess estrogen are excess cortisol, excess prolactin, uh, excess serotonin, um, and uh, leptin resistance and insulin resistance. Although, you know, they are different. That's why we're talking about in different categories. But often people who have big bellies also have big hips and thighs right they're often related although not always um and uh excess adrenaline would be in that category as well and then the things that are kind of oppose it would be uh, sufficient levels of testosterone sufficient levels of progesterone sufficient levels of thyroid hormone um sufficient levels of um sensitivity to insulin and sensitivity to leptin um, sufficient levels of GABA, those would be sufficient levels of dopamine. Those would be some of the things that I would look at um, in terms of hormones and neurotransmitters. And you're like, oh, this is all about hip fat? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, literally, you can see the correlation. Someone who has a lot of fat around the hips and thighs will be more likely to have, you know, low levels of dopamine and high levels of adrenaline. Yes, you know, it's absolutely is a correlation because... Oh, yeah, and, you know, inflammation goes with the estrogen and the prolactin. It goes with all the kind of, quote, unquote, bad side. So a person will tend to be more on one side or the other. And so you kind of want to shift them from the from one side to the other. And looking at those hormones is really helpful for that. Uh, lifestyle factors really related to estrogen. Uh, again, uh, anything that increases stress will likely contribute to excessive estrogen especially if there's already a tendency for it to be high um, there are no pathogenic organisms that create excess estrogen uh, directly unlike with some of the other things like they do create but they but do ser create like serotonin ser and noradrenaline adrenaline right histamine yes. uh, that's another one that would go in that category and all of those things uh, so histamine noradrenaline adrenaline 
serotonin can lead to raised levels of estrogen. So still, even through that direct, fairly direct mechanism, chronic infections could contribute to excess estrogen. Um, and uh, low thyroid is, you know, especially one because when low, when thyroid is low, then everything is slower. And when everything is slower, the detoxification of estrogen is also slower, which is more likely to make it build up. Um, then, you know, in terms of lifestyle environmental factors, we can also just call aging one of them, right? So as you age, uh, there is that tendency to um, have a higher ratio of, like, like with menopause, both estrogen and progesterone kind of crash down to be way lower. But usually, uh, progesterone crashes before estrogen, like progesterone um, plummets and then estrogen plummets. And so in that period before estrogen plummets and after progesterone or while progesterone is plummeting, you really become estrogen dominant. That's often where that fat starts to accumulate and then uh, never leaves because um, the estrogen is always dominant to progesterone even after right. you've so we'd need to, menopause. We'd need to get that estrogen in check in order for that weight, that fat to start shifting its way out. Yeah, and probably increase the progesterone. Um, but yeah, the whole thing. So get prolactin in check, get cortisol in check, get inflammation in check, and um, get adrenaline, noradrenaline in check, get serotonin in check, and then optimize the level of all the other good stuff. Yeah, because I think that's one of the hardest things is people just think, okay, it's just diet, it's just exercise. But as you're saying right here, there's also these factors that really need to be looked at. Yeah, and all of them could be it, to put it mildly. Um, and... Look, if you just try one thing, not you, Chrissy, but you, Chrissy, anyone, if you try one thing, if you try one supplement, if you try one hormone, if you try one exercise regime, if you manage to do it with any simple thing, then fantastic. But the point of this, again, is to try and say, if you really tried all that obvious stuff and it hasn't worked, here are all the other things you can look into and consider. And next on the list is acid reflux. Uh, yeah, so uh, again, are there genetic factors around it? Honestly, uh, this is probably just um, happenstantial, but most of the people I've met who have it, there isn't a genetic factor involved, but I would still want to know if that is the case. Um, so, you know, acid reflux could be down to an excess of stomach acid, but more likely it's down to uh, an issue of the, the valve, the sphincter between the um, stomach and the esophagus not working correctly and so therefore acid coming back up again. Why is that the case? There could be a few different things. Um, actually, a lack of stomach acid is considered to be the cause among most alternative practitioners, while an excess of stomach acid is considered to be the cause by most mainstream people. Uh, I would say both are to be considered and to be you know checked and see if they are helpful. Uh, so to go through the list, Genetic factors, uh, deficiencies. So if it is a lack of stomach acid, then common deficiencies are like a zinc deficiency, uh, protein deficiency in general. I think iodine deficiencies. So there are a bunch of different deficiencies that could be contributing to that lack of stomach acid. Um, if it is excesses, uh, in terms of excesses, um, a lack of stomach acid could be down to an excess, but certainly an excess of stomach acid could be down to an excess. So for instance, an excess of histamine would lead to an excess of stomach acid production, which could also cause acid reflux. Um, so look, worth looking at any excesses. Uh, chemical cell signaling instructions. So um, uh, for instance, uh, I think actually, uh, uh, we talked a lot about the benefit of a high amount of progesterone, but if your progesterone is very high, it can actually increase the chance of acid reflux because it relaxes everything. It will even relax that, uh, that valve. sphincter. Yeah. Which is why one of the reasons why I believe you're more likely to have acid reflux during pregnancy. It's also because the baby is literally physically pressing against everything, of course. But it is also because your body's got way higher progesterone than any other time that it ever will. And so that is um, softening that uh, sphincter and making it more likely for the uh, acid to be able to breach it, basically. That's my understanding of it. Um, I learned this because I have an issue with a different sphincter called sphincter of body around the gallbladder, and using progesterone has been a godsend for that because it's helped to relax that and stop that from getting stuck. Um, so while it is 
extremely helpful for that, it's kind of unhelpful for the other sphincter that you don't want to open, <laughs> which is the one from the uh, stomach to the esophagus. So uh, understanding sphincters is actually a very interesting, I first... Uh, oh, I can just see it now. There's a book, Understanding Sphincters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably why, you know, it hasn't been talked about, but you have a bunch in there and right. the dysfunction of them is yes. actually way more often a cause of problems than most people will suspect. I only learned about this a couple of years ago, um, but it's uh, it's significant. Uh, the um, sphincter between the small and large intestine is another important one. If that isn't working correctly, then all the organisms that are okay in the large intestine but not okay in the small intestine can start to come back and through, and that can create loads of problems. It's one of the main causes of SIBO, uh, the chronic infections in the small intestine, which is such a root cause of all kinds of diseases. So, yeah, sphincters are super important, and hormones definitely affect them. Um, lifestyle factors for acid reflux, it's well known that stress uh, – you know, if you exercise uh, on a full stomach, that's more likely to cause it. So all that kind of practical stuff. Uh, pathogens, that was obviously the big um, discovery a few decades ago that acid reflux, especially, you know, if it leads to stomach ulcers and stuff like that, often is caused by a, uh, a um, organism, H. pylori. And so uh, that's potentially, I know that they're different things, but there often is a connection. People who have stomach ulcers usually also has, have acid reflux. And so that's worth investigating as well. And emotional mindset. So before they discovered the chronic infections, you know, it was considered that stress was the number one cause. And of course, there is that correlation. Uh, so that's definitely worth looking into, as well as beliefs. As always, if you believe you're not going to get better, then you probably won't. Very true. Keep coming back to that one for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, next, we're looking at this a memory loss. And then, of course, you know, that can, as we discussed, as one begins to age, you know, that is definitely something that happens here, but it doesn't happen for everybody. So if somebody's experiencing it, how would they proceed? Yeah, so we did a whole episode on this, as with so many things we're talking about, uh, but just, you know, as an example run through, absolutely there could be genetic reasons for this. Some people have a better memory than others, and there's a strong genetic component to that. But memory loss, of course, means that it's worse than it was before, implying that it could still be as good as it was before, which is not necessarily genetic. Um, if we're talking about more extreme things, of course, like dementia, um, and Alzheimer's, then that's kind of a different thing. But let's let's just focus on lower memory because that is much more common and part of the kind of being metabolically run down situation that I see so commonly that we talked about a bit in the episodes on Wilson syndrome, what actually causes that. So I'd refer people to that. But anyway, uh, so deficiencies. So uh, choline is a particularly obvious one for this uh, because acetylcholine is the memory molecule. Um, and so choline is a nutrient that's actually quite hard to get enough of. And some people need more choline than others because they have a genetic uh, ability to make less of it than others. So that leads us back to genetics again. Uh, so choline would be not my number one nutrient to look at, but any nutrient deficiency obviously often can cause suboptimal brain function. Um, I'll especially look at the fats. Uh, so, you know, cholesterol, uh, the different fatty acids, uh, but you, you could look at B vitamins as well, magnesium, anything re related to energy production can ultimately negatively impact the memory. So all of that stuff really definitely toxins can lead to memory loss um, because they can literally damage and destroy uh, brain cells, which or connections between brain cells on a very direct level, or they can contribute to inflammation, which, um, you know, will impact the level of blood flow to and from the brain, which can ultimately lead to memory issues. So excesses can be huge. Um, hormonal imbalances can be huge for all the stuff that, you know, we've talked about many times before. If you're shifted away from the good hormones being dominant towards the, you know, more problematic hormones being dominant, um, then memory often is one of the first things to go. Just to explain why for a second, because... If you're running on adrenaline and cortisol and all these stress chemicals, often you can still function, like you can still focus unless you're really far along because that's part of survival. But part of survival is um, being able to focus and kind of be productive and function 
and respond, react to things, because otherwise they may kill you, or otherwise you might run out of food or whatever. And it's also to remember things which are potentially life-threatening. But it's not to remember all the details. It's not to remember, you know, your spouse's birthday and what you did last week and why did I come into this room again and all of that kind of stuff. Like anything that's not survival-related is deprioritized. And so that's often what you find. People start you know, having memory loss because they're in the survival mode for so long with high stress chemicals that they're able to function, but they're not able to remember very much because that's considered as a non-survival essential process, unlike, you know, being able to focus. Um, so that's potentially, you know, something. Uh, lifestyle factors, um, lack of sleep, stress, all the usual stuff. Uh, light, you know, even blue light exposure has been shown to reduce memory, uh, excessive blue light exposure. Uh, pathogens, uh, definitely indirectly through contributing to nutritional deficiency, toxicity and inflammation, uh, possibly even directly through, uh, you know, increasing plaque buildup, for instance, which can negatively impact um, the brain and therefore memories. Uh, and then emotions and mindset and beliefs. Um I think that's more in the case of, you know, expecting to have it happen to you. Oh, this is normal, you know. How do you, why is it normal to have much worse memory at 50 than you did at 30? Oh, because it just happens to people. What makes you say that? Oh, well, it happened to my mother. Oh, well, there you go, right? So that's one of those negative beliefs. Just because it happened to someone who you consider a role model or whatever doesn't mean that it needs to happen to you at all. But that's one exactly. of those beliefs that can hold you back. Yeah, especially if people just have that, that belief of, oh, that's just happen what happens when you get old. It's like, no, then you're already setting yourself up for those those things for the future because that's the vision that you hold for yourself. Yeah. Okay, no, that's really good. Um, next on the list is Lyme disease. Yeah, i be honest, I'm not super, like, expert in this or anything because it's not nearly as common over here as it is uh, over there. So I don't meet people with it that often. Uh, but we can go for the same process. So we do have a report on limes. Obviously, a genetic report can't tell you if you're going to contract it, but what it can tell you is you, you will have a high chance of having the chronic disease, which um, is an after effect of that infection. Uh, some people are much more likely to have that than others, so there's a genetic component to that. That's worth finding out. Um, obviously, it's worth testing to see to make sure that you actually have it, and there are tests which can help to be indicative of it. But let's assume that you have it. Um, deficiencies, obviously, this is uh, an issue related to the immune system as well as mitochondrial function, so deficiencies can relate to both of those. Toxins, there are some people who believe that that is the the kind of real cause of chronic limes that there's an excess of toxins that are actually causing this issue to be unresolved so that's worth uh, investigating hormones and neurotransmitters for all the reasons that we talked about again and again if you're on the negative side of that of lack of energy production lack of um, stress reduction on the side of uh, low energy and high stress then you're going to be on the side of high inflammation and insulin resistance and estrogen dominance and all of that kind of uh, bad stuff, which will negatively impact the immune system's ability to function properly and negatively impact the uh, detoxification system, liver, uh, the, uh, kidneys, etc., ability to function optimally. Uh, acute infections, obviously, other than the Lyme infection itself, if there are other acute or more likely chronic infections that are uh, keeping the immune system in a state of imbalance that can lead to that kind of state of chronic inflammation and autoimmunity potentially even, which um, is correlated uh, with Lyme disease. And then as always, a belief that I'm not gonna get any better or nothing is gonna work will often be self-fulfilling. Those again are very, very valid points. So yeah, as always, and has have we as we have been reiterating, go through the list, see if there is something that is showing up or could potentially show up for you. Yeah, this is not meant to be exhaustive on any of these. Those are all just examples and prompts and things for you to look into more, but more than anything, showing you how to use the system. Exactly, exactly. And um, chronic fatigue. Uh, yeah, something that I was not diagnosed with myself by officially, but something that many people told me I have, something that, you know, runs in my family. Um, so, yeah, let's finish with this one. So, 
as I just said, it runs in my family. Um, it, we don't have a genetic report for it, but we do have a genetic report for fatigue, if not chronic fatigue. Um, so we can still see if there is that tendency for it. Um, I ultimately am not sure if there is such a thing outside of all the stuff we've really talked about, meaning just like I said of depression, if you optimize energy production. Now, you know, the argument for chronic fatigue is that there are certain mitochondrial issues which prevent proper energy production and utilization of things, and therefore that is the cause of chronic fatigue. Um, my point is I would just call it like energy production dysfunction or something. I guess that's like a more helpful way of looking at it. And if we look at it that way, we can look at it, you know, through all the uh, the same steps as we always do. So is there a genetic factor which is stopping my mitochondria from creating significant, uh, um, uh, sufficient, sorry, energy? Is there a deficiency stopping my mitochondria creating sufficient energy? Very commonly there is. Is there an excess of something that's stopping my mitochondria creating sufficient energy? There are many excesses that are common that reduce the effectiveness of mitochondria to create energy. Is there a hormonal issue? We've talked about that a lot. Thyroid being number one, but cortisol being a very important as well, and all hormones, you know, potentially being significant in that regard. Uh, are there environmental issues? Um, so, you know, lack of sleep and stress are obvious, but, you know, we talked about light a few times in this episode. That can, again, be something that prevents the proper, um, you know, energy production. We could also put that under a deficiency, potentially. Um is there, you know, a lack of uh, movement that's caused it? Now, I know once you have chronic fatigue, many people, they can't even get out of bed. I understand that. But what I'm saying is that um, if you're not at that stage yet, then giving in to the, um, what's the word? Giving in to not moving, the, the, the instincts not to move can also be counterproductive. Obviously, overcompensating and pushing yourself too hard is also counterproductive. It's that happy medium between not not getting out of bed unless you literally can't but also not suddenly trying to push yourself really hard which will probably make you worse so the right level of movement for your unique situation whatever it might be and various other environmental factors pathogens yeah there absolutely is you know a lot of people believe that um uh that specific strain of uh, epstein-barr is uh, a root cause of chronic fatigue i'm I, when i say a lot of people believe i don't i'm not saying it's not true i'm just saying i i don't know enough about it but you know that's potentially the case and should certainly be investigated uh you know i think limes is another one that's sometimes you know, blamed for it so again that should be investigated and then of course emotions and mindset i mean a lot of people who i know who talk about this talk about you know potentially a victim mindset being part of chronic fatigue i've perceived that for myself um if you kind of believe that um the world is out to get you you're you know uniquely unfortunate um no one supporting you all of those kind of belief systems are very common and understandable when you are in such a low energy state but they are unhelpful and potentially can keep you in that low energy state even if you are working to resolve the physical issues. Beautiful. Oh, and this has been very, very helpful, informative, educational for all that, you know, are really interested in the rejuvenation blueprint, as I know I have been, and I'm really grateful that you've brought it to my attention, because as we've discussed, it helps put the power back into my hands with my health. Yes. And this is also helping other people. Again, not I'm encouraging anyone to play doctor, as it were, but you probably do have friends, relatives, or whatever coming up to you if you're into this stuff enough to listen to a podcast like this and say, what do I do about this? What do I do about this? You don't have to claim to be an expert in anything, but if you are actively trying to help these people, then you could start asking these kind of questions about them. You know, So if, if, uh, if someone that you care about comes to you with you know any of these issues we talked about or any other issue, you can ask yourself and ask them the same questions. You know, Is there any nutrients that you might be low on? Is there any toxin that you might be high on? Is there any genetic factor, you know, et cetera? You can run through it with yourself. You can run through it with a practitioner about yourself and you can also run through it with someone else to see if you can help them and prompt them uh, make them realize anything that they haven't thought of until now. Yeah, rightly said. Um, before we close, is there any other final thoughts or last things that you'd like to say to our listeners? Uh, yeah, I plan on bringing out a book about this soon. So please, I would appreciate your feedback. If you've applied and it's helped, if you think I'm missing anything, 
uh, let me know and um, maybe you will contribute to the book being the best it can possibly be. And if so, I'd appreciate it. Beautiful. As always, thank you, Ellen. Thank you for running us all through this. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As we said, please remember to, you know, leave us a review where you can. It really does help us. We appreciate you. We want to hear from you. We're, we interact. Ellen's always on YouTube responding to the comments as well. And we want to know more about you. And if there's something here that you're not exactly sure of how to run it through, put it in the comments below. Let us help you. Let us take a look and we'll see what we can do. And besides yeah, we, that, we may not be able to alter it in the comments comment section but uh we can probably do it in a future episode there you go so please as well remember to hit that like and subscribe button so you don't miss an episode and we'll see you next time hey i hope you enjoyed that video you may have noticed i recommended a few different videos in that episode and one of the ones i recommend is just here if you want to click there or another one i recommend is just below if you want to click on that one and watch that next